So make sure you all grab one before you leave, okay? with all of us. Help us, Lord, to uh, to live for you, and Lord, that others will see you living in us. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we can give back. We pray that you'll just bless the gift and the giver. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day we can celebrate together. Of course, we need to celebrate Easter every day, and help us to do that with our lives. We ask it in your name, Lord. Amen. There is a blood that cost a life that paid my way. Death is price when it's loud down from the cross. My sins were gone, my sins were gone. There is a grave. Tried to hide that precious blood that gave me life. But in three days, he breathed again and rose to stand in my defense. So I come to tell you he's alive, to tell you that he's right.
excited this morning, right? He is risen. What a glorious time to celebrate our risen Savior. Folks, everything that we believe in the Christian faith hinges on this one moment and this one time when Jesus Christ, when that stone was rolled away and the tomb was found to be empty. Everything that we believe, everything that Scripture tells us, all the prophecies from Old Testament to New, all hinge and balance on this one thing. And I want to share with you today the fact that today changes everything in our faith. I want to invite you to find your place in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. We're going to examine the Scriptures together today, and we're going to look at some aspects that changed everything as we know it in our relationship with God and why that is so important for us today in the Christian faith. We don't celebrate the cross and Jesus' death. We celebrate His resurrection because it is in that resurrection power that, as we sung about it, we indeed have eternal life through Christ Jesus. For those that have repented of their sin, those who have believed that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, we have sought His forgiveness, the very penalty. The the word in Scripture is the propitiation. Jesus bore our sins on the cross of Calvary. 
And when he died in that death and was placed in that tomb, that was the sacrificial offering, the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And when that stone was rolled back, as we'll see in a moment in the Scriptures, we know that was a signal that God's wrath against all depravity and human sin and unrighteousness was once and for all atoned for in the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that there's something that we don't have to worry about trying to earn our way to heaven, trying to pay our way to heaven, or even trying to work our way to heaven? James reminds us we do what we do because of our salvation, not to earn our salvation. For faith without works is dead, he reminds us. We do what we do because of the life-transforming power of Jesus Christ. So I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. We're going to read. You follow along in your Bible. I'll read it from the the text here. If you're there, say amen. Picking up in verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb and with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Let's pray together. So, Father, we thank you for the proclamation of your truth. We thank you for this reading of Scripture, and you remind us that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And we pray this morning that every person in the sound of this voice, every person that has heard your Scripture, will leave here knowing that truly Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Father, may we repent of our sins. May we seek you for the forgiveness that you offered up once and for all, for all humanity. We thank you for the empty tomb and the reminder of the hope we have of eternal life with you in Christ Jesus. Have your way with all that is said and done. And Father, if there is one here today that does not know you as Lord and Savior, who has never trusted you, who can't see because they have yet to believe, Father, we pray that today would be the salvation. Whether they're at home watching on Facebook or they're here in our congregation, Father, we pray today that today their hearts would not be hardened. Today would be the day of salvation. We thank you for this. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. So what is so spectacular about this resurrection message? For centuries, for decades, for thousands of years, people have proclaimed to worship some type of little G God. From all of Israel's fall all the way through to the New Testament, there's been no shortage of human civilization trying to worship something to get close and to fill a void that God has placed in the heart of man. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, the great writer Solomon in his wisdom says that God has placed eternity in the heart of man. And from that time forward of our creation in the fall, we have been trying to fill that void that's been empty for Decades, centuries, thousands of years with everything. But there's only one thing that can fill the emptiness of our heart. And it's the evidence and the proof of an empty tomb of a risen Savior. And His name is Jesus. God has done all that He's done to grab our attention, to help us understand why the resurrection is so paramount. That something has happened that is radically different for all of us to understand moving forward. And I want to share with you today four changes that were initiated at the resurrection of Jesus Christ from now and all through eternity. Are you ready for that? Number one, we're going to look at the Scriptures and we're going to see first off in verses 1 and 2 that there was a change in religion that occurred. Now bear with me for a minute when we talk about this. Often people that don't know I'm a pastor, when they find out what I do, I say, well, I'm a pastor. And they say, well, you know, I'm not a very religious person. I say, well, neither am I. And it kind of takes them by surprise. Because they don't understand that what we have in Christ Jesus is not religion, it's relationship. 
No longer Sabbaths and stones, but the sweetness of salvation that's been offered by Jesus Christ. Look with me in verses 1 through 2. Now, after the Sabbath, and we'll get to that in a minute why that's important, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Isn't it interesting that God used women? Where were the men? They were hiding in a room somewhere, scared. But the women go and do the hard work, right? They went to anoint the body of Jesus, even though they couldn't roll this two-ton stone away from it. Look at verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and, and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. Let me share with you a few observations that we see going on here. Number one, that there was a change in religion from that time forward for all of eternity. There was a dawning of a new perspective that happened at the resurrection moment. A dawning of a perspective. Let me share with you what we see here. For the women that went there, there was a difference between grief and astonishment to utter amazement. They went there in hope that they would be able to anoint the body of, of a dead Jesus, who, although he had told them, destroy this temple, and on the third day I will raise it up again. They didn't understand exactly what that meant. So they went in expectation to go and anoint his body and, and perform those burial rites and religious activities that were going on that morning. But what they found absolutely changed their perspective. It was no longer a religion-based thing, but absolute faith based on a promise fulfilled by an empty tomb. God did not reveal his glory first off on the Sabbath. Do you notice the, the text is very clear about that in verse 1? And here's something I've come to learn now being a, a theologian Bible student for a long time. When God writes something down and gives us His Scripture, it's always there for a reason. Now notice at the very beginning in verse 1, Now after the Sabbath. Now why is the Sabbath so important? Well, if you were in Judaism, if you were a religious person like the Israelite, like the Jew, they knew that God blessed the Sabbath and told them to keep it holy and righteous and to rest. God gave them that day to worship God. Now, what is God doing? God's showing us that the Sabbath that He gave to the Jew is no longer the most important thing. God chooses to raise Jesus Christ not on the Sabbath, but on Sunday. The very reason the Christian church gathers on Sunday, the first day of the week for the Greek. Did you know Sunday was the first day when people would start their week off in the Roman world? It wasn't Monday like we do. It would have been Sunday morning. The first century church would go worship at sunrise, they would gather together at Solomon's Colonnade, as we see in the book of Acts. They would worship, and then what would they do? They'd go to work. And I know for Baptists that's important, because if they didn't, we wouldn't have nowhere to eat lunch. Right? There was a dawning of a new perspective. God chose to reveal His glory, not to the religious elite on the Sabbath, but He chose the Gentile day of Sunday, the first day of the week, to show God's power and His glory, no longer in religion, but in His resurrection. Women were the first to confirm the resurrection. Now, why is that important, that the Marys went there? Did you know a woman during that time in that culture, their testimony in a court of law was inadmissible? They had no standing in social class to even tell anything in court. Their testimony would have been unvalued and worthless. Why do we find it in the Scripture? Because isn't it wonderful that God uses broken things and other things that others count as not of value to proclaim His goodness? God is telling us that this testimony given by women that would have been inadmissible in a, in a Roman court is now the validation for the proof. Now, why would the writers have included that? Because it had to have been true. Because if it wasn't true, they would have just omitted it. But it added value to the very fact that these women were giving testimony. Isn't that wonderful? Women used by God in mighty ways. There was a dawning of a new perspective for those ladies as there is a dawning of new perspective for you and I today as we read that account. But notice in verse 2, it goes even further. There was a demonstration of great power that takes place. A demonstration. God shook the world during that time frame. Notice verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake. God shook the world with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And did you know today God is still shaking the world at the name of Jesus Christ? How do I know this? Because, brother and sister, if you're in Christ, your world was rocked the moment you came to encounter Jesus Christ for yourself. The moment you went from skeptic, from agnostic to atheist, whatever classification where you didn't know God, when you encountered God, God shook your world to its foundations. Because it changed you forever, didn't it? 
It wrecked everything that you had built your life upon. All of the false idols, all the false gods, all of those things. And God rebuilt you on the rock of His Word and a new foundation that will stand the test of times. I know that's what happened because that's what happened in my life when I encountered Jesus Christ. There was a demonstration of power that God showed me in my own sin, in my own rebellion, in my own need for salvation and sanctification that I found in Jesus Christ. Some 2,000 years later, God is still shaking the nations to come to know Him with the Gospel. Perhaps He's shaking your world right now. Perhaps you're realizing, perhaps you're here seeking, perhaps you're wondering, what is this all about? God has drawn you together. Here's something that I believe wholeheartedly. Not a single person, man, woman, child, husband, whatever situation and season of life you may be in, if you are here this morning, if you are watching on Facebook, none of you are here by chance. God's providence has brought you in direct connection with the word of His truth and His proclamation. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, preachers don't save anybody. We just serve the meal and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Amen? God's Word does not return void. When His Word is spoken, when it is proclaimed, it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your heart that you may be feeling now that draws all men to Himself. There's a reason Jesus said that when I'm high and lifted up, I will draw all men to Myself. That high and lifted up came on that cruel Roman rugged cross cross similar to the one that you see behind me, glowing now in the radiance and the splendor and the glory of a resurrected Savior. But thirdly, I want you to see something about this change of religion that happened here, and I call it the descent of openness. The descent that happened. Notice the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, and he came and he rolled back the stone and he sat on it. What was that stone there for? That stone was there to cover up the body. It was there to hide the stench and the odor and the things that would take place in the coming days and weeks and months. As the death, decay, and rot began to happen, that stone would seal it so the outside world wouldn't have to deal with it. I remember this morning I was coming to work and where I live at, there's these little white and black things. They're pretty much white and they got a little black stripe or black with a white stripe running down, something like that. They call them skunks. And I noticed when I drove by that skunk this morning, I didn't even have my windows down. And it reminded me the rest of my drive here, what I had just passed. Because that skunk had had an odor to it. The skunk stunk is what happened. You know, that was the purpose of that stone, was to keep the stench of rot and death and decay from permeating for others so they could just go about life as normal. But here, God descended. He sent His angel to sit upon that stone and to roll back. Many estimate scholars, and when you study this stone, for it to be over two tons. And He rolled that stone back so that death no longer had a sting, no longer had a victory, no longer had an odor. Those women could see in clearly that Jesus Christ was resurrected What once had been sealed off by those not of Israel had now been opened to all nations to come and see the God of creation. The stone of religion was rolled back to allow righteousness to reign and for every tribe, every tongue, every nation to now be able to look inside and confess the name of Jesus as King of kings and Lord of lords. If you weren't raised in church, don't worry. God doesn't care about your religion. God cares about your relationship. I'm often asked when I deal with other pastors of different denominations and other people that come from outside the, the Baptist faith. They ask me, well, what, what denomination do you think is the most important? And I said, well, there's only two denominations that God cares about. And they all perk up. And they think, well, it must be Methodist, Presbyterian, Orthodox, Roman Catholic. I said, no, it's none of those. Well, they must be Baptist then. You Baptists all think you got it right. Well, that's true, but no, that's besides the point. You're either saved or you're unsaved. Those are the only two. You'll either hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, when you draw your last breath on this earth, and that road that you've been living on takes you to heaven's gate, and you're standing before an almighty God. And he says, why should I let you into the kingdom of heaven? He doesn't care about how much money you gave to the church. He doesn't care about how many homeless people you fed. He doesn't care about how many orphans you raised in your home. While all those are admirable things, did you know even the heathen does good works for humanity. 
lost in their death and their sins and their trespasses. All that will matter is do you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Has there ever been a time where you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you've believed in your heart that He was raised from the dead? If that's the case, then you will be saved, the Scripture says. Otherwise, you'll hear those wretched words, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. A change of religion from Sabbaths and stones to the sweetness of salvation we have in Jesus But the second change that we see that occurred at the resurrection is a change in requirement. Change in requirement. Look with me in verses 3 through 5. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. What do we see here again? We see number two, a change in requirement. No longer, no longer legalism, but rather the love of a Savior. God left heaven once again, and heaven's intervention came down on behalf of you and me. God left heaven's throne, much like we see Emmanuel, Jesus, who dwelt amongst us, God who dwelt amongst His people, and left heaven's throne. Once again now, the angel departs heaven to come down and declare the glorious good news of Jesus Christ. Once again, it's God's hand that rolls away the stone that lets us see in the clarity of the gospel that Jesus had been proclaiming during His earthly ministry. Once again, it's God's initiation for you and I to understand that He desires nothing more and nothing less than for us to be able to walk in His presence and to glorify Him and to know that He is God and that we are His people. That is God's ultimate design. When He designed us, when He created us, when He took Adama, the dirt, that's the name for it. That's where we get the name Adam. Pretty simple, isn't it? He breathed life into Adam and created him. Why? So we could worship Him. No greater thing we could ever do on earth. We can't give birth to children. We can't achieve enough. We can't build enough skyscrapers. We can't invent the Internet to be good enough to worship. The only thing we could do that's the crowning joy of all humanity is to be able to worship our God and Creator. We see here heaven again intervenes on man's behalf. No longer is it works-based religion. It's been extinguished. It is relationship that we have through Jesus Christ. But look with me in verse 4. Isn't it interesting how the guards, these Roman tough soldiers that were standing guard, ready to give their life in defense of carrying out their order, what happens when the very presence of God shows up? Dead men tremble. Dead men tremble. When I came to Christ and God confronted me of my sin, I thought I was tough, big, and strong, and all those things. But when I encountered God's presence, I trembled at the sight of my sin. I trembled in knowing what God had just showed me and revealed to me and my need for His righteousness. These dead men who didn't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, when He was in their presence, what did they do? The Scripture says those men froze and trembled. They couldn't do anything in the very presence of God. But notice what happens in verse 5. The third point, we see that fear is relieved when there's not only a proclamation, but a reception of the Gospel. Verse 5, But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. You see the contrast? Between men who are dead in their sins and trespasses, And those who went to worship the risen Savior, there's a contrast, isn't it? No longer are those women having to be in fear and trembling. But these men over here that weren't righteous, that didn't believe in Jesus Christ, were dead, pierced by fear and trembling. Isn't it beautiful that fear is relieved with the gospel proclamation? The angel tells them, do not be afraid. I know that you seek Jesus. What a response for all of us to understand that, brothers and sisters and friends, that when you seek Jesus, you no longer have to be afraid of God's wrath and His righteousness. But you can receive by the very grace of God the gift that He's given for your salvation. For it's by faith you are saved, not by works, lest no man shall boast. It is a gift of God. It is by faith that we receive the forgiveness of our sin. But lastly, we see that there's a new covenant requirement given to us here 
No longer are we brought up into our religion. No longer does our family relationship save us. No longer does our lineage to the tribe of Israel matter. What matters is the relationship we have under a new covenant. In Hebrews chapter 8 and Romans chapter 11, I've given you the verses there as a reference. The writer of Hebrews would describe this Jesus that would come, that would give His life, death, burial, and resurrection. And He would describe this new covenant this way. And He was echoing a passage from the Old Testament prophets. He says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. That I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God. and They shall be my people. They shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Paul would write to the Roman church, Romans eleven twenty seven. He says, and this is my new covenant, my covenant with them, when I take away their sin. Israel had never known what it was like to have their sins taken away. They had only known the covering of their sins, the masking of their sins, the blood being offered over the Holy of Holies, over the the Ark of the Covenant, the sacrificial lambs that would be slaughtered during Yom Kippur. They never knew what it was like to have their sin completely ratified, acquitted, not guilty, found. All they had done in all those years of offerings in the temple was appease the wrath of God by making atonement one year after the next, after the next, after the next. God was trying to get their attention, letting them know that they could not be righteous by themselves. Only Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, could make them righteous. What a beautiful understanding. The greatest gift ever offered to all humanity wasn't a gift found under a tree at our Christmas celebrations or even a gift hidden in a bush as we hunt for Easter eggs, but rather it was hung on a tree and placed in a borrowed tomb to secure the payment of our sins and our trespasses. And His name was Jesus. What a beautiful picture. Point number three I want to share with you as we turn our attention to verses 6 to 8. I want to share with you the change, not only in religion, not only in relationship, but the change in response that's now required. Notice what the text tells us. Beginning in verse 6, He is not here, the angel says, for He is risen. As He said, Come and see the place where He lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. What do we see happening here? Notice the response change. Number one, there's three changes that I want to share with you that happen for every single one of us when we encounter God's presence when we come in the very presence of God and we have a God moment and a God encounter where we know God is real and the gospel has penetrated our heart, turned the heart of stone to a heart of flesh, here's what I know happens. Number one, there's a change in countenance. It happened here with these women. Look in verse 6. He is not here, for He is risen. As He said, come and see the place where He lays. Now, they're running to the tomb. You can imagine this. At, at dawn's break, when the sun is coming up, burdened with grief with despair, with just complete confusion because they don't understand how this could have happened to the Messiah. They didn't understand the gravity of this stone. They didn't even know how they'd get in there to anoint the body, let alone they would find the tomb empty. They were absolutely downtrodden, broken, weeping, sorrowful. Sounds a lot like the condition many of us are in when we come to understand who Jesus is. We come there. And then in that brokenness, in that disbelief, in that despair, in that bitterness, in that anger, in that addiction, whatever it may be, when we finally encounter Jesus, there's a change of countenance on our face. Something changes greatly with inside us because we now, for the first time in our life, have what real hope is. And it's not in mankind. It's not in our jobs. It's not in our salaries. It's not in our home. It's not in your bank account. It's in Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forever. There's a change in countenance when we encounter the very presence of God. 
Doesn't mean life becomes roses, right? All rosy and wonderful. I'm reminded that every rose has its thorn, doesn't it? You work your way down that vine, and it doesn't take long to find them. Sometimes the Christian life can be difficult. It ain't going to be all peachy and better when you come to Christ. Matter of fact, I would argue the opposite is going to happen. Satan has lost one of his soldiers, and now he wants nothing more than to wreck and destroy your life and to try to ruin your testimony to get you back, which can never happen to a child of God. Life will be difficult. It will be a battle. It will be a struggle at times. But here's one thing for sure. We, re- we worship a risen Savior. Aren't you glad that He doesn't change? So there's a change of countenance when you encounter God. A change from seeking to receiving. But secondly, there's a change in confirmation. Now I want you to look back in between verses 6 and 7 and notice what's there. There's a period, a space, and a number 7 in your Bible, right? Now, notice the change in dialect and the transition that occurs between he is not here, for he is risen, as he said, come and see the place where he lays. Now, imagine a brief pause for about 30 seconds. And the women are looking in, and they see it, and all of a sudden, there's a change in everything about them. They go from a change in not only their countenance, but a confirmation that they have what I call the aha moment of everything that Jesus had been telling them. Everything about going away that I must leave you so the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, the Paraclete, the Comforter can come and dwell within you. Everything that we see in the Gospels. All of a sudden, in between the closure of verse 6 and the beginning of verse 7, it's like the light bulb came on. And they saw it. And notice how the next text describes it. Then they go quickly and tell the disciples. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, the angel tells them, that he has risen from the dead. It was that moment where they got it. There was a moment when that tomb was rolled back that they looked in and their faith had now become sight. They saw it with their own eyes. Folks, you know that's what happens to us when we come to Christ. And then once we've had that Christ encounter and we begin to read Scripture, our faith has become sight. And we can now begin to see the very things of God, the very processes and all that God has gone through to show us His love and His great mercy and what He desires for us, His goodness and His love. Paul would remind us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, that the gospel is utter foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who are saved, it is the power of God unto salvation, first to the Greek, or the Jew, and then to the Greek. Folks, without Christ, this book is just that for many. Just another book on a shelf with others. But when you have an encounter with God, it changes everything. The words on this page become understandable by your spiritual mind when you now have the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit is inside of you allowing you to understand what He's teaching us. But thirdly, notice there's a change in constitution. A change in what's making up their very nature and disposition. Look in verse 8. So they departed quickly from the tomb and with fear and great joy and ran to tell His disciples. Man, what could make somebody do a U-turn like that? From one moment of disbelief, disgruntledness, anger, bitterness, weeping, sorrow, confusion, to now a confirmation that causes them to turn around and go back and want to tell their brothers about it. Folks, that's Jesus. When you come to Christ, He changes your very DNA, your very constitution of what makes you who you are. You can't help but want to tell others about it. Isn't it beautiful? But lastly, let me share with you the fourth change that occurred at the resurrection And that was a change in a relationship that we're now able to have with Christ Jesus. And we see that relationship lived out in verses 9 and 10. Look with me again at verse 9. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of His feet and worshipped Him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. What a beautiful picture of what we see happening in the text. Notice first off that Jesus greeted His disciples as friends. Now that little Greek word, greetings, that you see there in your English Bible, when we look at that word kairo in the Greek text, you know what it means? It doesn't mean that Jesus met them with bitterness. Jesus didn't meet them ready to get even and settle the score. Ready to go back and, and, and ravish those in Rome that had crucified him, flogged him, ripped the very flesh from his body, and pounded the nails through his wrists and feet on a cross. 
Jesus didn't meet them with vengeance in his heart to go back and make the wrongs right. Jesus met them, as it's described here, with wishes of well, health, and happiness. He greeted them as friends, knowing that the death, burial, and resurrection was finished, and his true purpose for why he came was fulfilled in that very moment. When Jesus greeted his friends, notice again it's another God encounter. It doesn't say in the text that the disciples ran and found Jesus. What's it say? And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. Folks, none of us come to Christ on our own. Jesus always meets you wherever you're at to show you the way. As doubting Thomas would ask in John chapter 14 and verse 6, Jesus would tell them, surely I go to prepare a place for you. So that where I am, you may be also. He's talking about the Father's house having many dwelling places. That he was going to leave his disciples. And Thomas says, well, well, Lord, how do we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The good old Philip. There's a Philip in every crowd. Philip says, I, I still don't get it. And Jesus looks at Philip and says, Philip, have I not been with you all this time and you still do not understand? Friends, there are people that sit in church every Sunday who go through the motions of religion but still have no relationship with Jesus Christ. What a scary thought to know. And if that's you, don't let your fear of faking the faith keep you from accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. One day you'll stand before a righteous and a holy God. And I don't say that to scare you. I say that because of love that Jesus had, that He'd be willing to die on a cruel cross to demonstrate His love for you that what, yet while we were sinners in the very presence of doing sin, Christ would be willing to go to that cross so that you would come to know salvation once and for all. Folks, if that's not what love is, I don't know what is. He demonstrated it for you. But notice Jesus greeted His disciples. God again initiates the encounter with not only them, but with us as well. But secondly, we see that Jesus' disciples, when they see Him, what do they do? They worship Him. A true disciple desires nothing more in life than to worship. I share this with every church that I go to, and I remind them the role of a pastor. Did you know God didn't call me to grow the church? No. When I say that, sometimes people get, well, wait a minute, what is your job? In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. My job as a pastor is not to grow the church. You know what my role is, as is yours? To make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you to the very end of the age. Jesus would give His disciples that very commandment after this encounter on a mountaintop called Gal- in, in Galilee, where He would meet them for the final time before He would ascend back to the Father. Go and make disciples, Jesus commanded us. Brothers and sisters, that's why I'm here. That's why others are here, to make disciples, not good church-going folks. Good church-going folks sometimes will go straight to hell if they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We're called to make disciples. Jesus' disciples wanted nothing more than to worship Him. A physical, tangible, emotional aspect of worship. Jesus met them. Another God-initiated encounter. And when He did, notice in verse 10, that Jesus' disciples, their fears were relieved. Point number three, their fears were relieved. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. That word phobia is where we get our English word phobia from phobos. That word to be afraid in the Greek text. Jesus says, you have no reason to be fearful anymore. You're my disciples. I have forgiven your sin. All of your sin, all of your unrighteousness, all of that stuff is gone. The psalmist writes in Psalms 103, verses 1 and 2, As far as the east is from the west, your sins have gone forevermore. The depths of the ocean, they cannot be found again. That's why Jesus, when He encountered His disciples, notice He didn't encounter His church members. Now, that's an oxymoron because you can't be a disciple without being part of the church. That's a whole other theological discussion. But he encounters his disciples. Matthias, the followers of Jesus. That's what that word means. When he encounters them, notice he says, do not be afraid. If you're in Christ Jesus, you're a disciple of Jesus, you have nothing to be fearful for. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Amen?
Jesus' disciples, their fears were relieved. And lastly, notice what happens in verse 10 as we close our message. He says, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers. Adelphi, that word, being literally kinship, family, male and female, brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. Brothers and sisters, if you're in Christ Jesus, there's going to be a day where we're going to see Him face to face. Where we will see Him as He is. We will know Him. We will sit and we will kick back and we will dine with the King of kings and Lord of lords in heaven's throne with Him. We will get to meet the apostles Paul and John and Peter and Simon and, and all of Jeremiah and Joshua and Ezekiel and Nahum and all those wonderful folks, Obadiah and Micah and Malachi. We'll get to feast with them in heaven because we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Jesus says, go and tell the others to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Jesus calls them brothers. John 15, 15, verses 15 through 17, Jesus tells the disciples this. He says, I no longer call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Aren't you glad that when we come to Christ, when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, that we have been adopted into God's family? We're no longer servants, but Jesus considers us brothers and sisters in Him. What a wonderful understanding of who we are. Let me close with an image that you may be familiar with at this point. But I'm often reminded that that stone wasn't rolled away so that Jesus could get out. The stone was, a res- was rolled away so that we might be able to get in. So that we could understand what Christ has come to do once and for all, forever. To tell us die, that Greek word, it is finished. Aren't you glad that He is risen? That's the Lord and Savior that we seek, and that we serve, and that we love, and that we worship. Today is the day of salvation, saith the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ, What's stopping you from knowing that? The tomb is open. The stone has been rolled back. You can clearly see in, and I know through this message that I've shared with you today, from God's Word, it's been made clear that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So I want to invite you now with every head bowed and every eye closed as we come to our time of invitation. A time of invitation is that time where you have heard God's Word. You have not just heard some preacher standing up at a pulpit and lecturing you on something, but you've heard the very Word of God proclaimed in this place. What do you do with it? If you're a believer in Christ, I'd encourage you to pray right where you're at. Lord, show me, Lord, how you've called me to be a disciple of you. Lord, there's so much more to the resurrection, so much more to my faith, so much more and deeper you want me to go in you. Father, show me where you'd have me to serve, where you'd have me to worship where you would use me for your kingdom's glory. Lord, reveal that to my heart. Give me clarity of those things that I may honor you in your resurrection with my life. And friend, if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, when we begin to play this music and I'm going to stand right in front of this pulpit and there will be several people down here at front to greet you, if you would like us to pray with you to accept Christ, If you would like prayer for the forgiveness of something, you don't need to do that with me, but I'm here to pray with you to help you encounter God's very presence in this place this morning. Don't wait if God is stirring your heart and you know that you need salvation. Get up right where you're at and make your way to the front. So, Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the privilege of celebrating the resurrection. What you have made known to us by faith, we now proclaim to the world that all will one day confess Jesus Christ as Savior. Father, we thank you now. If there's one here that does not know you, we ask that you give them the conviction of the Holy Spirit to draw them to yourself. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing as we have our time of invitation. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow
one quick announcement with you. We've got a baptism that will be taking place. Baptism will be next Sunday. I think there's a slide for that if you'll, you'll show it up there. April 16th, uh, we will celebrate baptism here at Stanleyville. So if you need baptism, if you've not been baptized, maybe you were sprinkled as a child and you want to confirm that faith through immersion, every biblical example we have of baptism from the New Testament was all done by immersion. So if you desire to be baptized, uh, please let us know, and we would love to do that for you and with you and celebrate with you next Sunday and during, at our 11 o'clock worship service. With that said, Brother Steve, why don't you close us in a word of resurrection prayer. Lord, we just thank you for uh, another wonderful day in your house, Lord, and for the sunrise service this morning, Lord, and for the message from our preacher today. Lord, we're just grateful to serve a risen Savior. Lord, we just ask if there's anyone that is not know you, Lord, that they would come forward and accept you as their Savior. Lord, we just praise you and worship you as we go out. Just be with us today and the rest of the week, Lord, for it's in your name we pray. Amen.